what I'm going to share with you today is uh, basically it, it doesn't come from any uh, research paper or anything like this. It's I'm drawing on my conversations with my friends and colleagues and also some really nice contributions to the ideas for India. I want to give you just very brief tour to all the events that transpired after the first case was detected in India. They always say that the virus doesn't differentiate between the Indian and Australian or American and so on, which is very true, right? And it's also true that this is a global crisis and every country has to face this terrible trade-off between shutting down the economy and shutting down all the economic activities at the same time risking lives by lifting the lockdown, right? So the lot, lot of conversation today is when do you lift the lockdown and so on, right? And uh, Debraj Ray has a very nice way of capturing this. And he, he says that in most countries, you know, people who would uh, argue in favor of prolonging the lockdown, they would say, look, how much is the human life worth? So it is lives versus economy. What do you choose? Put it that way, the choice is simple. But what I want to bring out to you is really uh, in what ways India is special. Because as Debraj has pointed out, in India, it's really lives versus lives. Because shutting down the economy is not, you know, slowing the growth rate and bring the GDP down and things like this. It is really playing with the lives of millions of people who are already close to subsistence. The picture I want to draw. And so for most countries, it's a health crisis. It's a pandemic. And also it's an economic crisis, right? Even in the most developed, in the richest countries, there is an economic crisis. But what I want to bring home to you is for India, it's much more than that. It has a potential to be a nominal humanitarian crisis. Fear is rising inside me that we may be really heading toward that. So what I want to do to you, first of all, kind of very, very briefly give you a state of the existing healthcare in India. And then explain why uh, India is different, why it may be a humanitarian crisis. I want to lay bare in very simple terms, just the structure of Indian economy. Then I want to give you a brief background again, is in what way, what was the state of Indian economy pre-COVID? Already there was a talk of slowdown and so on. So basically Corona hit Indian economy when it was down. Then we can kind of go through, you know, the victims, the migrant workers and so on. And then I'll try to tell you like how every government has some salient considerations in their mind, how it's playing out in India. The government of India's recent announcement about welfare relief packages or stimulus packages. State of healthcare system in India is very, very poor. The public health spending as a percentage of GDP for a long time, perhaps the lowest even among developing countries. Like this is all the World Bank data. Number of doctors per thousand compared to China or the world, very low number of hospital beds per thousand people. Almost any metric, India is not prepared to deal with coronavirus. Now, we've been lucky. India has been lucky because at least the numbers are not as bad as they could potentially be. And we don't know if it has reached the whole thing. We don't know if we know all the numbers, right? A lot of people dying every day in different villages and so on. Do we have a good record? We don't know. But let's just assume that numbers of at least the death rates are uh, more or less right, but we're not really prepared. Now, this is just a, a picture of the how different states are in different states. Vertical axis, you have the hospital per one lakh people. And you see a lot of states are really clustered in that left and bottom corner. But please note here the diversity across the country. Different states are very much very different level uh, in terms of preparedness. And this is something to talk about later on that in fact, the right thing for you to do there being such great differences, vast differences across states, is having giving more resources to the states so that they can make their own decisions, which is what is happening, but they are starved of resources. The pre-corona state of Indian economy, just in 2019, all the talk was about growth slowdown. Why is it slowing down? What should we do, right? It's a, why is the investment slowed down? Right? So one was really that uh, Indian growth spurt was really based on the driving sector was the software exports from India, the West, and that demand internationally had slowed down due to various reasons. There was a slowdown in the 
world growth for a while and then um, innovation that like, my paid candidate was really the decline in the demand from the informal sector as we'll see when we discuss the structure of the economy that the informal sector most of india toils in the informal sector. typically these are very very small firms family firms self employed so really in some ways gig economy the small workshops but they are a very important sector not only in terms of employment but also in terms of the percentage of gdp they produce is over 50% now there's a whole background to it all these did down did not just happen just like that but the informal sector which includes the agriculture is in the rural areas most of the informal sector is also cash economy and a real a blow was delivered to it in the form of demonetization when suddenly 86% of the cash is withdrawn but informal sector forms a very big part of the aggregate demand so, you know much more than 50% and this kind of drop in demand also created slow down on the formal sector the organized a lot of workers now in the meantime there had been a sort of a continuous cascading of problems the going back several years when corporate debt had started climbing and in fact on 30% of gdp to 60% of gdp by 2017 and now the inventory is piling up because the demand had dried up of course the corporate stopped investing so one of the things was also for some time now the indian the growth of gdp was really based on few sectors that employed very few people especially very few unskilled people and the formal sector wasn't creating enough jobs to absorb the labor from agriculture right so and that was a very big reason for rural distress from same amount of land number of workers were kept on growing there could not find jobs in the urban sector for some time there had been huge emphasis on building infrastructure It was recommended for long time but what kept happening was the infrastructural uh, development did not really yield returns because you know it was expected that uh, once you build the infrastructure then there will be industry it will generate uh, profits it will generate tolls for the highways the, all this did not happen several projects uh, never even got completed and the creditors banks and non bank financial uh, companies they got saddled with heavy defaults along with that came many other things the corruption scandals and so on so a lot of banks were facing massive defaults on the balance sheet but with all this there was a lot of uncertainty the some of the government action the business could not understand uh, the tax rates and so on all this had slowed down the economy and big things that all these corporates pointed at is there is no demand why should we be investing it is important to kind of point out why rural distress slow down at why would it slow down the urban economy just to give you a picture of to what extent it forms an important part of aggregate demand right so if you look at the rural households now count for 57% of aggregate spending while the urban ones accounted for the rest 43% of course the urban households buy more of the consumer durables and 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 i'm mentioning this because a lot of times when we think of the manufacturing sector we just think of consumer durables cars and tvs and so on but consumer durables account for a very small part of the aggregate demand uh, there are a lot of non durables simple things that you don't think of as is industrial products but we just take for granted right and if you look at the non durables a uh, rural sector is in fact have uh, something like uh, almost 60% of the total aggregate demand right so when the rural sector slows down it uh, it certainly has a huge impact on the overall industrial demand not only in the rural sector but also in the uh, urban sector this is some of the reasons and of the slow down right now the importance of demand and what i want to come back to later on is in any measure that government can think of they have to build a demand which is on the verge of total collapse okay what is the chronology the first uh, death report is january 30th then there was a janta curfew partial quarantine was uh, declared march 22nd then total lockdown march 25th and this was uh, the, the announcement of uh, the lockdown was a bit surprising it was done with 4 hours notice really 
And now what you have to know is there are like something like, I don't know the exact numbers, but around 40 million migrant workers who have come from the rural areas to cities. They were caught by complete surprise. There were no special uh, trains organized for them to take them home. Then the first relief package was immediately announced by the finance minister on March 26th. May 3rd, there was one extension of the lockdown and then people were eagerly waiting for the second relief package and then I'll tell you in detail what happened there. And today, I guess there are something like number of confirmed cases, this number of deaths, 2752. But India is a very populous country compared to the total population. These numbers look uh, uh, amazingly low. Okay, and I, I guess uh, the lockdown is now further extended to May 31st. Now, this is the structure of Indian economy. It's still a very poor country. Now, you know, the poverty was always computed from the national sample survey data. And the last national sample survey data we know is 2011. So, this 2011, it was still you know, the headcount ratio is something like 20%. But if you kind of looked at the whole distribution, uh, twice the poverty line, almost uh, three quarters of the population was below twice the poverty line. Of course, that's consumption expenditure, not incomes. Very recent uh, paper by uh, CMIE, Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, along with the Chicago Booth School, uh, Marianne Bertrand and so on, that drawing our attention to the desperate state of many Indian households. They say only 34% of households have enough savings to sustain themselves for more than a week without assistance. This, this came out last week, so it's kind of today maybe the end of the week. Again, going back to the structure, the formal companies, which is really registered company more than 10 workers, it employs only 17% of the workers. But productivity is high there. They produce almost half the GDP, while the informal sector employs 83% of the workers and produces 52% lower workers. 83% of the total workforce works in informal sector, right? But even the organized sector employs a lot of casual workers. Almost 36% of the workforce in organized or formal sector, casual work, they're informally employed in the sense they have no formal contracts, no paid leave, no benefits, right? This means nearly 92% of the total workforce in India is informally employed, right? So things like uh, wage subsidies, this is not an option in India, right? The kind of things that uh, developed countries are uh, undertaking, that's not an option. If you look at the 83% of the workforce in informal sector, a lot of informal sectors are tiny, tiny firms. I mean, we're calling it firms because they're sort of, you know, they're, they're business units. A lot of them are either family enterprises or they're self-employed. I mean, the, the average uh, labor force across these informal enterprises is like 1.2 or 1.5, something like this, which means a lot of these are just self-employed. These are the people, the vendors, street vendors, the rickshawalas, the, the guy who owns a cigarette shop in the corner or a dhaba or something. So most of India's economy is really a gig economy. And, you know, you find countries like... Uh, US and so on, a lot of people are really employed in a tiny restaurant or a bar. But India's economy is mostly... Okay, now uh, what happened? Impact of the lockdown, right? So before the lockdown, about 404 million workers were working. 119 million out of them had lost their job by April 13. That's the reason I'm saying April 13, because that's the, the source that I uh, looked up uh, was really published April 13. There, there must be a lot more who have lost their jobs. If half of them were the solitary uh, earning members in their households, and uh, in many cases that's true, then that is, you know, 60 million households, which means, you know, if you roughly say five people per household, 300 million people are facing a severe livelihood crisis. This is the source. And it is again based on CMI data. Out of all the people who got uh, badly affected, perhaps migrant workers in urban sectors, the worst affected. And th that's why we're going to look at their case quite separately. The rural households are also affected because a lot of these migrant workers are really they are sending remittances to their... So, of course, those take these remittances for granted, they would be badly affected. 
casual workers in urban areas who are not going back but who are staying there you know again street vendors rickshawalas uh, self employed people in various petty services all affected the supply chains of the essential goods and of course food is the essential good uh, have, have been kept running and so the farmers are really not as badly affected this time as the rest in the informal sector but they too have suffered because of the disruption to the uh, supply chains loss of remittances coming from uh, their household members from the cities and so on. if you think of the first uh, the victims the people who were affected badly right off the bat these are the migrant workers right now about 40 million migrant workers from rural areas to urban areas and these are crucially important to the construction industry these houses being built you see these people now how do they survive in their places of work right i mean the abhijit banerjee at once kind of explained this you know that lot of them don't they just do with bare minimum sometimes they just live at the construction site they may sleep under a truck or something all you know many of them don't bring their families big part of the money they earn in this construction sites they send back home to their families so when suddenly the tax fell a sudden announcement by the prime minister that you know there's a lockdown starting in 4 hours they couldn't go they were just trapped in cities and with very little savings right they have they, they have no real savings that they that could sustain them for this period of lockdown they would like to go back home but there was a scramble but you know the transport was also blocked buses trains all came to a halt and these guys were trapped in the cities right and this was a, a pretty horrible situation and in fact probably saw these pictures of just uh, thousands and thousands of workers walking home walking hundreds of miles right they come from these poorer states which are really labor labor exporting bihar jharkhand up mp to urban centers like ahmedabad mumbai delhi uh, bengaluru and so on right so even now very late i mean they should i don't know really i don't understand why the, the government did not immediately arrange for transportation for them to go home somebody hadn't thought about what kind of situation they were put in right and even now belatedly when the trains were started to take them home Uh, just to add um, insult to injury the railway is asking for payment to uh, take them home and of course now there is a discussion what is the impact on the rural sector the main reason for the distress in the rural sector was um, formal sector had uh, failed to siphon off the labor and the labor was accumulating on same amount of land but i have no doubt that once uh, everything resumes come back to the cities however scarred they are from this experience because for the same reason they left their homes in the first place the playbook for any government during the lockdown right what does the government think of and this is uh, here i'm not just talking about india any this is this is sort of a generic so first of all the government has to ramp up the healthcare system no healthcare system uh, however good was prepared for this pandemic right you just don't have enough icu units you don't have enough ventilators even in the most developed the main reasoning behind lockdown is it to buy time to prop up your to kind of get your healthcare system in order you have to get the protective equipment ventilators uh, uh, testing kits medical personnel no country has enough medical personnel to give uh, tests to everybody then you have to kind of train people quasi medical you have to put the hospital beds in new york there you know uh, creating tent hospitals and so on that's the first order of business okay the second order of business if you see the agenda if you see the uh, announcements by almost any government is to take care of those who have lost their incomes because of the lockdown especially the poorer half now one difference between developed countries and india i said is that the the poor in india are have very little sustaining power the very little savings right but even when i'm watching the north american news even here the people they don't live day to day but they live to some extent month to month and not being able to pay rent or uh, not being able to buy food for 2 3 months 
is a problem facing even the workers in the gig economy of developed countries. And most governments are quite aware of that and are taking care of that. In Canada, for example, uh, anybody who has lost his job due to coronavirus will immediately get $2,000. Immediately. And that's the main thing. These transfers are arranged without any time delay. In Canada, for example, if I file an application, I will immediately get the money. Is that fair? No, because I will have to give the money back when it comes time to pay taxes. Everybody is pretty much on the tax roster. Right? That's not the case in India. But the key principle people have followed is the help has to be extended immediately without any bureaucratic delays. Thirdly, you have to make sure that this shutting down the economy doesn't completely destroy the productive capacity of the economy. Someday, you know, there will be a vaccine, there will be antidotes, the pandemic will be brought under control, right? And the economy will revive, but the economy will have tough time reviving if its productive structure is already dented, uh, half destroyed. How can that happen? Because the firms always have some fixed expense, right? They, they have to pay rent for their place. They have to pay some utilities. They have to pay interest on the loans they have. Uh, they have obligations. I mean, most firms are just uh, borrowing from the bank they have for the working capital, they're, they're paying the variable expense like the workers and the materials and so on. And this is the chain that goes on, right? But once the economy shuts down, all that is stopped, right? And yet the obligations for the fixed cost remain. You have to make sure that firms, big and small, remain solvent. And the, especially the small micro uh, firms and so on, they may not have the kind of access that the big firms have from big banks. And so the government has to move in. And again, that help has to be provided without a lot of time delay, right? Let's last but not the least, you have to keep the supply chains for uh, food especially running. Now, one thing uh, I want to point out about the Indian uh, political structure is the, what does the federal structure imply? Now, according to the constitution, there are certain areas which are under the jurisdiction of the state alone. There are certain areas which are under the jurisdiction of both center and state and some under center. Now, health is a state subject, right? Which means hospitals, the medical uh, uh, equipment, all this is really uh, the, the responsibility of the states, right? But the states have very few resources that they can draw on. Right? So one thing is that uh, the most of the government revenues going accruing to the center, something like 40, it stays with the center, 42% is dispersed across all states. So, you know, some states will get 2%, some states will get 3% or 4% out of the central government revenues. I mean, the, one of the main sources is now this uh, GST. There is a central GST and a state GST and a, a small part of the state. Most of the, now the supply chains are running, but most of the GST that the states get are the non-essentials, non-food. But that traffic is closed because of the shutdown. So that source is closed. What else can the state get? Well, they get some taxes on the liquor, they get taxes on, you know, there's an excise duty, minor things, right? So what happens in a time like a lockdown due to Corona? On one hand, the requirements for medical expense by the state goes up. And at the same time, unless the center provides them a greater part of government revenues, they are in bad trouble. So the states are now really hurting for resources. And in fact, quite understood the down on liquor sales and uh, even e-commerce. Why? I don't know. Liquors have now started, uh, but uh, that's just a small part of the total. This is the kind of condition you have to keep in mind when we assess the government uh, welfare packages. As I explained in the chronology that, uh, you know, initially the first package was released and uh, everybody was disappointed. Why? Because it was just too small. Now the second package has been released. And when the first package was uh, released, it sort of 
loan moratoriums and uh, things like this but in terms of real cash transfers there was a there was an item but it seemed it wasn't big enough and many of us felt that oh this was just the first step there'll be second step and third step and fourth step there'll be many other steps but obviously this is just the first step they don't want to start big they uh, they want to kind of get into it slowly right and so we are all waiting for the second package and then the prime minister made a speech where he says uh, yeah germany is 20% uh, us 10% uh, uk 15% of their gdp well we are not behind we are going to offer 10% of gdp and then we are all felt happy right that is 10% that is something yeah good you know it's our own gdp 10% uh, and a lot of countries are doing this so it's kind of reasonable when you look at and we we'll, we we'll look at that uh, briefly at the package but when you look at this package there doesn't seem to be even a faint recognition of the impending humanitarian crisis right there is hardly any support for the financially vulnerable i mean shockingly so i i don't understand why they call it a stimulus package but there is no serious attempt to address the problem of collapsed demand right every mainstream economist has been screaming for you know give cash in people's hands right the the demand is collapsing you, you got to give stimulus even the most uh, conservative spokesmen kind of people who are not known for immoderate advice and so on are are saying please spend more right now demand is collapsing but for some reason that was just not listened to now what about protecting the productive capacity right so we'll just kind of look at it in in terms of those four salient points in the playbook so there is some effort in making borrowing easier with the help of rbi some new credit lines for the msmes or micro small and medium enterprises the only place where the government actually uh, promises to be a guarantor for msmes uh, is the only instance where the government of india is actually doing something which has to do with spending right but once again i don't think msm is a happy in fact uh, help is also coming through credit agencies trust fund rather than uh, the government being the direct the guarantor i don't know the details of this why not give the direct payments to micros i mean you can imagine these are tiny firms right they don't have a lot of kind of savings uh, there they probably don't have huge amount of credit support you know they have to pay rent they have to pay the insurance payment they have to pay utilities this is a kind of again fixed expenses right they need the help now you know why not just give direct payments i mean if you see the emphasis is on government doing it directly they are not just leaving it to the banks in india is mostly kind of left to the banks or some other agencies right they have done a bit about uh, maintaining the productive capacity mostly through kind of monetary means okay and then there were whole other things which just left me completely puzzled about you know it was a bewildering experience that you know when you're talking about kind of long term things like um, reforms this government has been in power for 5 years Okay, and the reforms they did not do, they haven't done for these five years. All of a sudden, they are announced along with this uh, welfare package. I mean, so why are you packaging this with relief, uh, disaster relief announcement? You know, it was a call for Swadeshi, which is kind of buy goods produced in India, right? Promise that would occupy a prominent place in the global supply chains. It's not really clear what that has to do. with the present relief i mean it's almost like you know right now people are hurting the firms the households as well as little firms they're hurting they need help now and you're promising them some rosy future of reforms reforms to farmers if, uh, you know in the agriculture oh yes those reforms are necessary some of these but i'm not going to comment even on the kind of reform suggestions why is it now bundled with this disaster relief announcement is beyond me i mean it's almost like you know some heart patient comes on a stretcher and is uh, is been sent to the operation theater uh, because this surgeon is going to as promised to perform the heart surgery which is urgently needed which is cardiologist everybody said he must have 
And when he comes there, instead of performing surgery, the surgeon kind of uh, tells him, you know, forget the surgery. Uh, look, our hospital is building a gym and um, a nutrition program and uh, uh, so that to make sure that uh, no, nobody ever will have to come on a stretcher like this. You know, it doesn't make much sense. HSBC, this bank, has uh, put together a table because it kind of tells you the second package also includes uh, the first package. Okay, so so this is the total package. It is over ninety percent of what was promised. I guess it's nine nine percent of GDP rather than ten percent. So maybe one more percent is coming. So if you look at this, you see the the two columns of numbers here, right? And then the last one is the fiscal cost. Okay, the middle one is monetary measures or uh, things which have precious little to do with, the, for example, increasing the wages of Manrega. But Manrega is not operating right now. For example, discounts. Yes, something should be done about discounts. There's a greater liquidity and so on. What does that have to do with Corona? So there's all these things on the left hand thing. They're not all useless, by the way. I mean, these are, these are some of these things are needed, but these are not fiscal costs. So the fiscal costs are all here. And if you count them all, they add up to 0.8% of the GDP. 0.8% okay? as compared to what other countries have done. Is this level of support adequate? Okay. Now, how do you count all the actual support okay, and cash transfers to households? This is what it amounts to. The first item is really given extra food rations. Now, you know, India is served by these PDA shops all around the country. They have, they get, typically they get uh, five kilos of cereal, rice or wheat per individual. So it's like 25 kilos per household. And this really amounts to basically doubling the cereal take for last, for next four months. Okay. Plus they're adding one kilo of pulses which haven't really actually arrived in many uh, of the it amounts to doubling of their usual PDS. One might say, okay, so the poor are taken care of. They don't have to spend any on food. There are actual cash transfers in the, this year in the first package and the cash transfers to uh, 204 million women with these Jandhan Yojana accounts, right? So these are the accounts where there's a sort of a direct benefit transfer. It can be accomplished. Now, I computed that comes out to about 0.15% of GDP. Okay. And we don't know again that are these going to the real needy people? How big is the exclusion errors? For time being, forget all that. Okay. Supposing they're going to the right people. There's an increase in pensions of widows, seniors, and disabled that accounts for 0.014% of GDP. Okay. Then there was already a scheme for the farmers where they get 6,000 rupees. Now the 2,000 more rupees have been added to that. Total cost is, fiscal cost is 0.075. Okay? So the total cash transfers is really 0.25% of GDP. Is that enough? Why do I worry about the humanitarian crisis? Again, the Bertrand and Krishnan study released on May 13th said one third of Indian will run out of resources in a week. Why are cash transfers needed, right? Why isn't the support in terms of food enough? And that we need to really look at carefully. But in general, cash is needed for all kinds of things. There are other essential expenditure items than just food, right? There is rent, the utilities, the loan payments. Many of the households may be indebted. The medical expenses, these are all essential expenditure. These are not luxuries, right? Cash is also is needed for essentials like soap, oil, condiments, and that PDS does not dispense that, right? So total of cash expenditure for households on non-basic items far exceeds the total cash transfers in the government package. That's what I want to show, right? And they need help now, not later on. To do this, we have to kind of uh, act quickly, minimize the exclusion errors, okay? So I was wondering how do I figure out how much is needed for essential and uh, Bharat Ramaswamy uh, suggested the NSS data from old as it is 2011. It can tell you, so this is the fractile class of the monthly consumption expenditure. You look at the bottom fifth 
of the total income pyramid. Okay, so these are zero to five percent. So they are the poorest of the poor. Okay, and this is rural area. And then, what is the share of food in consumption expenditure? And more or less, I mean, these are these different columns just correspond to different methodologies of computation. Okay, but you see, kind of the bottom fifth, just concentrate on the bottom fifth. It's, it's more or less sixty percent of their consumption expenditure is on food. Okay, what else are they spending on? Now, and here we do some calculation. So the bottom five percent of households spend sixty percent of their income on food, out of which only one third is on cereals plus pulses. So this is what they get, and we are assuming that they are not. Once you double the rations for the next four months, their cereal and pulses needs is taken care of. Good. Okay, but then forty percent. What else are they spending? Forty percent. Forty percent of their incomes are spent on non-food items. They include all these things. Rent. We have these numbers here in terms of you know consumption expenditure on food. What what percentage it is? But then how do I go from that to the actual incomes in rupees? Right. You calculate today's rupees cereal and pulses subsidy, right? Because government is giving free. How much does that amount to? Assuming thirty rupees per kilo for grain, eighty rupees for Paul says the expenditure becomes something like around fifteen hundred, right? And that we know is to be twenty percent of the expenditure. So total expenditure is of the order of seventy five hundred for the bottom. Okay, these are the poorest people. They have very little saving. They have very little luxury expenses. So you deduct that value of the subsidy. That is what is saved. They don't have to spend. So then they need another sixty one hundred rupees. Okay, for per household. So divide that by five, assuming size of the household is five, then that means you have you need about twelve twenty rupees for each individual in cash transfers per month until the economy starts functioning. Okay, let's make a very optimistic um, assumption. Let's say economy starts functioning in four months, right? But the money should be made available as soon as possible with minimum paperwork. And bypassing the usual technological impediments with many other things without bureaucratic delays, right? It's very crucial to keep all these exclusion errors out. Okay, so supposing this much cash is transferred to every single citizen of India, right? How much will it come to? So that comes to three point two four four percent of GDP, giving it to everybody. Which is not necessary. Supposing you restrict it to only the bottom three quintiles, right? Then it comes to two point five nine percent of GDP. Is that too much? Now, this is where when we listen to the sort of the commentators on TV, uh, you, you feel a bit frustrated. A lot of them comment as if nothing has changed. They use the same kind of yardsticks. During normal normal times, these are not normal times. There is an attitudinal change across the globe caused by this pandemic, right? And one thing that all these governments are very well aware of is the specter of prolonged demand collapse. Like, what would happen if pandemic ends or under, comes under control? How will the economy ever perk up if the demand is totally collapsed, right? And if we don't spend now, the future will be very bleak. Right? I would businesses who would they produce for? You know, normally we kind of think supply creates its own demand, life goes on, so on. Here, when the household finances have collapsed, when a lot of little firms have gone out of business, how will the economy be revived? Right? That's what people have in their minds. You saw Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, just urging the U.S. Congress to spend more. Right? He's not known as a come some kind of left wing radical. Everyone times are different, and most governments are kind of have realized that. But I don't think government of India has, right? And in fact, if you look at it, like uh, there is this caution: don't indulge in borrowing; it will cause inflation. The deficit is already so much. You know what will the rating agencies say? Is this the time to worry about rating agencies? Right? What is the present reality? The firms are not investing. Right, the banks are flooded with liquidity. They don't know what to do with this excess cash. They are parking it back in 
RBI, the, the central bank, because the RBI gives them some interest, which is called the reverse repo. Otherwise, they get zero interest. So what, what does that do? That is actually reducing the money supply. So instead, why can't the government borrow that and use the money to sustain millions at the margin and keep the household finances somewhat undamaged? What are the other countries doing? If you look at all these European countries, you see that you know this, these are the direct spending by the government. These are kind of deferred payments, which means that the government gives you immediate grant, but you know the taxes on that will be collected later or something. That is this part, and this is pure liquidity. And these are all big numbers compared to what India is doing. What is the position like in the in terms of? Worrying about rating agencies. First of all, why worry about rating agencies? Are we are we going to borrow somebody so much from outside? Right? Present public debt is 70%, external debt is not huge, saying that 20% of GDP. Uh, India has always had a good credit record. The inflation rate is uh, reasonable. About 475 billion, I just checked this morning of a foreign reserve. Yeah. So don't understand this caution, which I think in fact is the reason. I am afraid of thing that I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the Ibraj race is lives versus lives, and it's indeed so. The economic shutdown is a lot more problematic for Indian masses than anywhere else. And that time, Debraj uh, and his uh, co-author, A. Subramanian, argued that, you know, in fact, shutting down is worse than taking the risk of facing the corona head on. What they had suggested was, keep the lockdown only for the old and vulnerable, let the younger people work and take the risk because this risk, the cure is worse than the disease. And at that time, I didn't agree with hindsight what government would do to support those at the bottom. I would have completely endorsed their scheme then. I mean, not that my endorsing and their proposing would have mattered one bit. I was going to talk about the various implementation problems in cash transfer because I was sure there would be a massive support to the lower classes and a lot of such articles coming in Ideas of India, problems with the existing system. But all that now is superfluous because I doubt very much if there are any further cash transfers coming. You can judge if my fears for an impending uh, humanitarian crisis are warranted or not. Thank you.